Chapter Ten: Making an Impact. In the Israel Defense Forces, pilots and paratroopers get most of the credit for defending the nation. Tanks make up the backbone of the IDF. A highly visible Israeli navy patrols the coast on the Red Sea and from Gaza up to the Lebanese border on the Mediterranean coastline. When it comes to intelligence, the Mossad is feared abroad and venerated at home. When violence breaks out, the cameras go where the action is. Reporters speak with the crews inside the Iron Dome missile defense batteries. They film soldiers of the Givati and Golani brigades with machine guns slung over their shoulders, carrying heavy backpacks and ammunition. The media reports the voices of helicopter and F-16 pilots describing their missions while hiding their faces to protect their identities. Talpiot's members are rarely interviewed on domestic or foreign news, and the program's massive contribution to all of those defenders of Israel is invisible to the public. Yet it's really the Talpiot graduates who spent so many years consistently helping to make the IDF and its impressive arsenal so effective during wartime and during the quiet times between conflicts. In fact, Talpiot graduates have come up with so many ideas, designs, and updates to Israel's weapons and technology arsenal, an official count is not even kept by the Ministry of Defense. The contribution of Talpiot to Israel's defense went far beyond anyone's imagination, primarily in three areas: research and development, the Israeli space program, and electronic warfare. Israel's space program grew up alongside Talpiot. Its graduates have contributed directly to Israel's space program by creating space vehicles, electrical systems, communication systems, and by working on the cameras carried by Israel's satellites. In Israel's mind, staying ahead of the Arab armies and navies isn't enough. It must also stay ahead of the more advanced technologies from first world nations supplying weapons and weapon systems to the nations that pose a constant threat to Israel. In the early stages, when the Talpiot project was first getting started, the Navy benefited most from its efforts, largely because it was more welcoming to Talpiot than other branches of the military. Just prior to the formation of Talpiot, the Navy had done some impressive soul searching. It had suffered a terrible loss four months after the huge success of the Six Day War. A brand new breed of Russian missiles, fired by Egypt, slammed into the Israeli naval ship Eilat while it patrolled international waters in the Mediterranean Sea. While the crew of the Eilat waited for evacuation and rescue from other Israeli ships, Egypt again fired on the wounded vessel, sinking her. Forty-seven Israeli sailors were killed in the attack. Another forty-one injured. Israel was shocked into becoming much more serious about defending its fleet at sea. The six years between that deadly attack and the 1973 Yom Kippur War was very busy for Israel's navy. The sea force drilled. They updated their equipment. Officers studied the naval successes of allies abroad, and it all paid off. The Israeli navy was one of the few branches of the IDF to perform exceptionally well during the Yom Kippur War. Though the general staff was starting to realize how valuable the navy could be, only a small part of their defense budget was earmarked for the navy. When the first classes of Talpiot students graduated their Hebrew University coursework, many began to gravitate toward the navy. Eli Mintz had become an expert on data mining during his post-Talpiot military service. He was a pioneer in developing programs for the Israeli navy using algorithms to improve radar systems. Mintz says. The Israeli Navy was very small in the 1980s, but it was quite sophisticated. I was very motivated in the Navy to learn and apply what I learned. To Mintz, it was a two-way street. He wanted to help the Navy on its course to innovation, but he also wanted to learn what the people who were already there were working on and how they were developing state-of-the-art hardware and software. One of the best things about Talpiot, Mintz recalls, was that after graduating, you had your choice of postings, assuming the place where you wanted to go would take you. Nobody else in the army gets to do that, so I picked a project in the navy where I did a lot of project management. It started with algorithms, but it evolved into managing certain aspects of a project from the technical side. I was able to wear two hats, doing real technical work and also project management. The exact project Mintz worked on remains classified. You don't develop iPods in the IDF. You develop weapons. We developed a weapon which has since been improved by others in research and development. The weapon he worked on had been deployed, but it had not yet been used because Israel still hadn't fought the kind of extensive naval battle where such a weapon was be used. 
If the weapon is used, it will have a big and immediate impact, he adds confidently. Gilad Lidera is one of the most interesting and colourful of the Talpiot graduates. Lidera also joined the Navy and became one of Talpiot's first combat officers serving on a missile ship. His post-army work took him to Africa, including many countries in the midst of civil wars. More on his amazing post-army business journeys in a later chapter. Growing up in the 1970s, Gilad learned to sail as a boy and he always loved the sea, though that was not common for the average Israeli boy. After Talpiot graduation, his first assignment was to the Naval Academy. He served on a Sa'ar 4, a fast missile boat about 400 tons and 190 feet long. He rose in the ranks to become a bridge commander before moving back into research and development. His operational knowledge learned at sea combined with his Talpiot training made him extremely valuable to Israel's navy. Lidera went on to work on developing and improving electronic warfare systems for the navy. Specifically, he worked on passive electronic warfare defense systems designed to monitor the communications of other ships. Lidera also worked on missile evading electronics designed to help Israel's naval ships track and dodge incoming missiles fired from the sea, the shore or the air. If you can mess with their homing systems, they can't hit you, he says cheerfully. He also went on to work in ship design, coming up with ways to make Israel's ships harder to detect with radar and harder to strike with missiles. Ziv Belsky is currently a leader and innovator in Israel's still fast-growing pharmaceuticals and medical devices industry. While doing his service, however, he was a true innovator. He also was one of the first Talpiot cadets to become a combat officer. From Talpiot, he also went on to the Naval Academy. His assignment was to serve as the executive officer of a Sa'ar 4.5 class missile boat, the most advanced in the Israeli Navy. Belsky brags it even had two helicopter pads. After serving at sea, he was transferred back to land at the Israeli Navy's research and development headquarters. Somehow during this time, he managed to study electrical engineering and earned a master's degree. His job soon became to develop and innovate electronic warfare systems for use at sea. He and his colleagues came up with new technologies to defeat missiles fired at Israeli ships using electronic defences. He says, if you have a fast missile and you can shoot it down, great, rocket to rocket. But if you have a system that misguides and tricks rockets, that's better and more consistently effective. You need tricks. For Talpiok graduate Ranan Geffen, the Navy also was the path to the Ministry of Defense's research and development branch. After Talpiot, he served as a naval officer, then began developing new radar technology and anti-missile systems. To move his idea forward for the benefit of Israel and the United States naval forces, he shared Israeli naval technology with US-based military contractors. About his work, Geffen says, a ship must be able to defend itself against all threats. Radar is for navigation to detect hazards in the winter to see other ships outside your line of sight. You need surface radar to defend against airplanes and drones. Without radar, the ship is alone and in the dark. But it's not enough to have a good system in place, Geffen insists. The crew must be able to use it properly. During the Second Lebanon War in the summer of 2006, Hezbollah launched a shore-to-sea missile likely manufactured in China. It slammed into the INS Hanit, which was patrolling the Mediterranean in international waters adjacent to Beirut. Four Israeli sailors were killed, but the crew managed to get the ship back to Israel for repair work. The problem in this case was simple. The officers on board the Hanit failed to activate the ship's radar and anti-missile capabilities. Thinking Hezbollah lacked the technology to hit the ship, despite warnings from naval intelligence that Hezbollah did have a shore-to-sea missile capacity. To this day, Geffen is still dismayed over the decision not to use its anti-weapon system to guard against such attacks. Talpiot has also had a tremendous impact on communications in the Israel Defense Forces. Because Israel is a small geographic area, armed forces transmissions can easily be picked off by even rudimentary eavesdropping equipment in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Developing ways to encrypt and keep these communications secret is a major priority. One of the early pioneers in this field is a graduate of the second class of Talpiot, Boaz Ripin. His army service was dedicated to making radio signals impossible to intercept by the enemy in the mid-1980s. Israel was at war during this time in Lebanon, fighting Yasser Arafat's PLO, then the Shiite-backed groups Amal and Hezbollah. 
Ripplin had never heard of Talpiot before being chosen for the programme in 1980. He admits that when he joined the unit, he wasn't sure it would work out. It was a gamble. Nobody knew what graduates could do with what they'd learned. I felt like I was part of an experiment. The programme was constantly changing. Born in Tel Aviv, Ripin was 11 years old when the Yom Kippur War broke out. An alarm sounded in Tel Aviv as rockets were shot at the city. Car lights would be dimmed, apartment lights would be shut down so the city could not be seen by bombers above. I watched a lot of television. There were reports of people dying. I was worried about my father. He was a surgeon. He was waiting at a field hospital near Tel Aviv. I knew I was in danger. The fear of losing the war was palpable. People spoke about what would happen if we were conquered and defeated. No one thing shapes who you are, but the war did shape who I wanted to be in the army, to a large extent. I wanted to do as much as I could to help. This was part of the reason I decided to give extra service. I wanted to have an impact. David Kutasov was nine when he moved from Lithuania to Israel, and he didn't speak a word of Hebrew. He recalls now, it's amazing how quickly a nine-year-old can learn. Kutasov remembers training with paratroopers in Arab parts of the West Bank and doing a drill where he and the other members of his platoon were supposed to sneak into the area at night. The villagers woke up in the morning and came out of their houses. They spotted us immediately and started laughing at us. You have to understand that I grew up in Khlon, just south of Tel Aviv, completely shielded from the terrorists and the Arabs. We were taught to ignore Arabs, not to discriminate, but just to pretend that they didn't exist. Here I was in the West Bank, and all of a sudden it turned out that not only do Arabs exist, they don't like us very much. It was a big shock. To this day, he's credited with changing the way Israel's ground forces operate. The projects I worked on had to do with enhancing the fighting capabilities of tanks and infantry using all sorts of advanced technology. I haven't been in the army in 20 years, but the problems I worked to solve surface today in Lebanon and Gaza. One of the men that was in the program with me and stayed in the army recently told me that something I worked on is now viewed as a bible for the people working in the tank corps. But I don't think I can say any more. As Kutasov discovered, for Talpiot grads there are no drills. Everything is real. You are given technical challenges to write programs or build something that is critical to the security of the state. That adds to the pressure and the desire to get the job done fast and done well. More Amitai is a legend among legends in Talpiot. Many of his colleagues and Talpiot comrades say he can literally figure anything out. After finishing his Talpiot coursework, designing communication systems became his focus. A member of Amitai's team on a communication project for the army told of an instance when it was crucial for the IDF to know if the answer to a certain question was yes or no. The army would have to do things in a very different way depending on the answer. They needed to know if something specific was possible. If the answer is yes, it is usually easier to prove. Something exists. If the answer is no, sometimes it is harder to prove. In this case, we were in between. We all worked so much and so hard on it that we all believed it was impossible. Sometimes when you try very hard at something and fail, it is very close to proving that it is impossible. The project is still classified and shedding light on the specifics could lead to catastrophe for men in the field. The man on Amitai's team continues, It was a program for a complicated system that should perform under different conditions. In the army, you don't control the environment. For one soldier in the field, anything can happen, even if he's trained well. He can trip, fall, or drop a weapon. This question was similar in some regards. It was a big question for the army. Will it perform well enough under certain extreme conditions? You cannot test these conditions unless you, he laughed and said, I really can't tell you more. All he could add was, the army could not function well without it, and it was something the army needed at the time. The army uses the system quite widely. In his five years of service, Amitai was responsible for complex components of communication systems. Sometimes he worked on projects from scratch, sometimes he had to alter something already in existence, and sometimes he had to combine different kinds of systems. A lot of the work was analysing what can go wrong and how it can be updated in the future, as the specifications of different systems need to be updated for field use. As in the example above, Amitai's work in army communications always had to take the unexpected into consideration. A colleague familiar with his work explains, it's like a car. A car is something you can test. It goes well, air conditioning works fine, everything. But a car should also work well under circumstances that are not under your control. This is why manufacturers invest in crash test simulators to see what will happen when another driver makes a mistake. 
In the army, you also don't control the environment. The enemy is out there. It's worse than when you drive a car. Someone's not making a mistake. Someone's trying to make you fail on purpose to kill you and your friends. It's like building a car to withstand the tactics of other drivers who are trying to run you off the road. So when you design such a car, you don't have a full picture. You have to think what the other drivers will do or what the weather can do to you. We spent most of our time analysing what we were building to see if it will survive awful conditions. Life and death are definitely motivational and might intimidate some individuals. But Moore and his team were constantly told, you belong to a small group of very talented problem solvers. The army has invested a lot in you. Talpiot is the longest course you can take in the army, even longer than pilot training and service. We've invested in you. Now go make us look good and don't fail. Chapter 11. High-Tech Tinkerers Intelligence is where Talpiot has had one of its most dramatic impacts. Following the Agronac Commission's close scrutiny of the failures of intelligence in the Yom Kippur War, the Israel Intelligence Corps was created. The Corps includes the famous Unit 8200, discussed in Chapter 9, which creates software programs, search systems and internet defence systems to repel cyber invaders. The Intelligence Corps also works on tracking signal-based intelligence, which includes monitoring radio frequencies, tracking telephone calls, as well as other electronic signals. The Corps also monitors and analyzes what is known as open source intelligence. That includes monitoring the media in foreign countries, including newspapers, television stations and radio broadcasts. In many authoritarian countries, the government uses state-controlled media to control its citizens, and sometimes sends messages to the West by way of their media. One of the first intelligence field assignments given to a Talpiot graduate was in 1982. Ofer Roth, recruited to Talpiot's second class in 1980, found his way into Israel's burgeoning new intelligence forces. Israel was pulling out of the Sinai at the time. Prior to that, when they had bases and intelligence equipment in the Sinai, they could listen to and watch the Egyptian army. Now the army needed capabilities to access the same intelligence, but from further away. I worked on making that a reality. Another game-changing Talpiot graduate has become a modern-day Israeli Renaissance man. For security reasons, his name can't be published. He is a tinkerer by nature, and since he was a child, he has liked to build things. After graduating from Talpiot's coursework at Hebrew University, he declared his desire to be in the real green army. Equipped with small arms, he would get his chance as a roving tank killer. He became Talpiot's first commander in the armoured car division and he set a sparkling example for others to follow. For four years, his job was to track enemy tanks with small bands of soldiers and take them out, without armour and without a lot of backup. As he moved up the chain, he was offered a chance to go to battalion commander courses. In 1997, he told the army, no thanks. He would serve as a tank hunter in the reserves, but he wanted to get back to the technology that helps give Israel a leg up over its enemies. His next stop was an intelligence technology unit. It all started with an interview with the head of the electro-optics division. I remember he asked me, you finished Talpiot four years ago, and what do you want to do? I said I didn't know. I knew I wanted to be back in research and development in technology. He took out a very small camera and said, Anything you find interesting here? Oh, I like cameras, I answered. In my anti-tank unit, I was actually working with cameras, signal processing, electro-optics and cameras. It was a perfect match. He had the formal education and the army field experience to help design what was needed for other combat troops. This was actually exactly how Talpiot was supposed to work. A promising and motivated soldier gets an early and excellent education. He then hits the field, Afterwards, he combines both to help give Israel access to more efficient and more lethal weapons, making the army better and stronger. I started out designing a small board with a camera and signal and video processing unit, then onto larger components and larger cameras and optic systems, he continues. The device I was working on was to be used for special tasks and missions. They were for the intelligence community, not necessarily the army, he says slyly. 
While he would not confirm it, it's likely devices he worked on wound up helping Israel's various security agencies that monitor and police the hostile Arab populations living in cities and towns east of Israel's major population centers. We were making very, very tiny devices. They would put them where tiny devices were needed most. These kinds of devices help many people to do their jobs, many of these missions nobody will ever hear about. One of Israel's most immediate and pressing problems comes from Gaza. Why Gazans aren't a threat to the overall security of the nation, thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israeli civilian communities by Hamas, Islamic Jihad and other terrorist groups. Terrorists have attacked and attempted to break into Israel dozens of times and on one occasion in 2006 killed two members of a tank unit and took another soldier, Gilad Shalit, hostage. In order to discourage border-crossing terrorism, the IDF set up a ring of surveillance stations to protect communities near Gaza without having to engage anyone who appears to be approaching the border in a threatening manner. Brigadier General Eli Pollack, head of the Field Intelligence Corps, told Aviation Week, Our job is to provide surveillance along Israel's borders. To do this, we use various intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance systems which help us track the enemy and assist ground forces in quickly locating attempting hostile infiltrators. Here again, Talpiot graduates have played an outsized role in helping to develop and install sophisticated monitoring mechanisms. Ophir Zohar, 14th Talpiot class, served in a technology unit in the IDF. He says, the most advanced stuff in our circle was dedicated to building better technology for IDF intelligence. It was our job to come up with solutions for problems the army thought were impossible to solve. Created by a team working on new components for tank units, the groundbreaking technology known as the Trophy System addresses one such unsolvable problem. Trophy is designed to protect tanks against rocket-propelled grenades and other deadly and more accurate anti-tank weapons. Israeli defense contractor Rafael, in connection with the ELTA Group Division of Israel Aerospace Industries, has outfitted Israeli Merkava tanks and some armored personnel carriers with it. Trophy has its roots with Professor Azriel Lorber, who taught hundreds of Talpiot students the art of military technology during his 19 years of affiliation with the program. Professor Lorber served in the IDF Armored Corps in the 1950s, rising to the rank of major. He received a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh and then a doctorate in aerospace engineering from Virginia Tech. After his studies, Lorber moved back to Israel and eventually went on to work for two major Israeli defense contractors, Israel Aircraft Industries, which later changed its name to Israel Aerospace Industries, and weapons maker Israel Military Industries. Though originally rejected, the idea for the trophy system was later adapted modified and finally brought to fruition by Rafael. While the IDF was initially reluctant to install the trophy system because of its cost, the Second Lebanon War in 2006 made it clear it had to move forward. 52 Israeli Merkava tanks were hit by anti-tank missiles fired by Hezbollah. Israeli military leaders came to believe that the next war would be against a tougher, stronger, larger army that would put its tanks in even greater danger. If this is what Hezbollah could do, they didn't want to see what would happen if the IDF suddenly had to fight Hezbollah, the Lebanese armed forces, Syria, Hamas and perhaps even fighters from other fronts all at the same time. As Lorber had originally planned back in the 1980s, the tank has an onboard warning and radar system that is activated by incoming projectiles. Those projectiles are identified and then a shotgun-like firing mechanism shoots a defensive projectile in buckshot form. The goal is for that defensive projectile to spread out its fire, connect with the incoming projectile and then force it to prematurely explode before hitting the outer shell of the tank. In June 2012, the Jerusalem Post reported that State Comptroller Micha Lindenstrauss had heavily criticised the Minister of Defence and the IDF for not expanding the use of trophy faster to protect more tanks, armoured vehicles and especially the Namel armoured personnel carrier. During Operation Protective Edge in July and August 2014, Trophy got its first battle use. It successfully detonated and destroyed a Hamas anti-tank rocket, saving both the tank and the crew inside. The army had been tight-lipped about the details of that first successful combat use of Trophy, but in no uncertain terms, a spokeswoman for the IDF says, it has now been proven to be successful in combat. 
The Israel Military Industries Company, also known simply as IMI, has developed Iron Fist, closely based on technology used in the trophy. It is stronger than the trophy in that it is capable of deflecting more powerful tank shells, not just the handheld anti-tank weapons the trophy is capable of defeating. While the Israeli Ministry of Defense did approve usage of Iron Fist in 2009, that decision was later overturned, and as of now, the technology and the know-how behind it has been put on ice. While the Iron Fist and Trophy systems are designed to protect Israeli soldiers in ground combat, usually not far from Israel's population centers, the long arm of Israel is the Israeli Air Force. It can strike without warning all over the Middle East and well into Africa. In recent years, Western media reports say Israeli pilots have been called upon to hit targets carrying Iranian weapons moving throughout Africa, Syria and Lebanon, as well as weapons making plants in places as far away as Khartoum, Sudan, 1100 miles away from air bases in southern Israel. After his Talpiot academic career at Hebrew University came to a successful conclusion, Marius Nacht went on to work in aerospace. He helped design and manufacture airborne systems for the Laviv fighting jet. At the time, the Israeli-made Laviv rivaled the F-16 and the MIG, the MiG. But there were problems. First off, it was very expensive. Should a country with only 6 million people spend hundreds of millions of dollars on making a fighter jet? Or would it be more cost-effective to take the money Israel gets from the United States after signing peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan, who also get US money for defense for signing those treaties, and buy proven fight and flight tested American planes? A second big issue was pressure from the American government against the project. The United States didn't want to compete with the Lavi in the lucrative international defense market if at all possible. Israel always has been nervous about its reliance on other countries for defense. After the Six-Day War, France, Israel's main supplier for fighter aircraft, suddenly decided it was better to align itself with the Arabs than with Israel. France had been supplying Israel with Mirage jets made by Dassault. When Charles de Gaulle and France turned their backs on Israel, it was left with a true security crisis. Where would it find airplanes? Fortunately for Israel, the United States quickly stepped in to fill the void as President Lyndon Johnson saw in Israel an ally that could be a check against Soviet aggression in the Middle East. In part because of the trauma caused by the French and because of Israel's expertise in aerospace, it decided to move forward with the Lavi project. Several Lavi aircraft were produced by Israel Aerospace Industries. The maiden test flight took off on December 31, 1986. Reports say the plane was remarkably responsive and manoeuvrable in the air, fast and smooth. But in the end, Israel's government believed that building its own fighter was neither economical nor politically expedient, so the project, while successful, was halted. Nacht says, When word came in the Lavi had been cancelled, I was upset. It was a phenomenal fighter, and it could have been a game-changer for Israel. Yet at least many of the systems that are being used now are based on the system we developed on the Lavi back then. On a jet fighter, everything must be interconnected. There were many advanced concepts regarding interface. Now they're the standard, but back then they were on the edge. If we'd had to go to war, they would have made a huge difference. A good portion of Nacht's work on the Lavi was onboard in-flight missile defense. It was a very innovative and creative way of protecting airplanes from missiles. As far as I can tell, it's still not being deployed. The Department of Defense in the US now knows everything about it, but I think that system is still ahead of its time. There might be reasons why it is not being deployed now. There must be a good reason, but I don't know it. Many of the things Nacht worked on, including airborne missile defense systems, were later adapted for use on Israel's fleet of F-15s and F-16s. Israel has a special contract with the American manufacturers of the fighter bombers. In essence, Israel is allowed to install some specially designed Israeli components for communications, missile defense and radar. Intelligence estimates say that Israel has about 75 F-15s made by Boeing and about 330 F-16s manufactured by General Dynamics, all of which have Israeli designed and Israeli manufactured electronic warfare systems that advanced rapidly during and after the work done on the Lavi by engineers like Marius Nacht. Similar arrangements have been agreed upon between Israel, the United States and Lockheed Martin, which builds the F-35. All of the new F-35 jets arriving in 2015 and later will have advanced Israeli electronic warfare systems. In addition, Lockheed Martin also agreed to buy about $4 billion of equipment from Israeli defense contractors to install 
into the body of the advanced fighter bomber. Another Talpiot grad, Amir Peleg, worked on targeting mechanisms for Israeli F-15s and F-16s, though his primary work involved the research and development of high-tech cameras that could go on UAVs and tell the difference between different kinds of targets. More specifically, says Peleg, we built computer-driven vision devices that allowed for automatic target recognition. You want a gun to be able to distinguish between a tank and a car. We worked on things that are still in use in this field. Tzvika Diamant is a rarity for Talpiot. He wears a kippah and is religiously observant. He is one of the few students to have come to the program from a yeshiva rather than from a secular high school. During the interview portion of Tzvika's tryout for Talpiot's sixth class in 1984, he was asked, how does an airplane work? With a grin, he says, I knew that one. That question was prescient. After finishing his Talpiot coursework with the equivalent of three majors, physics, computer science and mathematics, Tzvika went to work on installing and integrating Israeli-made electronic warfare components that were to be added to Israel's new and growing fleet of F-15s and F-16s. He was the Israeli Air Force's representative inside defense company called Elisra, now a unit of Israeli defense contracting giant Elbit. During the five years he worked there fulfilling his commitment to the army, Tzvika was involved in every aspect of development in new systems. He was just 21 years old when he was started there, and Elisra was filled with more senior engineers who weren't always on the same page with what Tzvika or the Air Force wanted. He notes, it was very difficult, unpleasant at times. They were from a time before Talpiot, and they did things differently. They largely knew about Talpiot from news articles, but had no actual experience with Talpiot graduates in the workplace. Some were nice, some were nasty, and tried to get rid of me. I was stationed in the offices of the contractor. I had to define the acceptance tests for systems, and for each stage to make sure they were on track. I was in all the meetings, trying to provide them with solutions when we got into disagreements. And there were a lot of disagreements. They wanted to deliver what they had so they could get the money from the army, but sometimes what they wanted to deliver wasn't what we wanted. Over the years, they learned that I was sent by the Air Force and they had no choice but to accept me. The Air Force backed me up every step of the way, all the time, so they learned to deal with it. Once the electronic warfare parts were made and ready to go, Tzvika would lead the testing process. He often worked with Air Force pilots who had also studied to be engineers. This way they could act as both a pilot and engineer, determining what worked and didn't work and why during the test flights. Some pilots in the Israeli Air Force do their service for about five years, then move on, but later serve in the reserves. Tzvika's testers were some of Israel's most experienced pilots. Many had 15 or more years of flying experience. That was especially useful because they were very helpful when it came to looking at the issue from macro and micro points of view. Tzvika explains, Let's say there was an experiment of a missile coming from one side, but we wanted the bigger picture. You take the aircraft and turn it 180 degrees, then 360 degrees, so you can see the level of the signal on all sides, where the signal comes in high, where it comes in low, and where it is not identifiable. The pilot has to have a deeper knowledge in order to do the test perfectly. He needs to go beyond what he used to do to get rid of enemy aircraft or incoming surface-to-air missiles in combat. He needs a deeper understanding of what was working and what wasn't. That knowledge will save lives later on in a real fight. What we were doing is working with signal processing. You get the radar signal in your receiver, then you analyze the signal to identify what kind of missile is threatening you. ASA-6, a Patriot, whatever. For each kind of different missile, you react differently. For some, you transmit loud electronic noise to cause the missile to miss you. For others, you throw some flares to deceive heat-seeking missiles. You have to identify the missile threat within a few seconds to give you time to react to the threat. If it's transmitted from another aircraft, the pilot has to react within seconds sometimes. After 20 seconds, the fight is over. During tests, we simulate the signal. We're not actually firing missiles. Sometimes you can simulate the battle situation with another airplane. In the late 80s and early 90s, Tzvika was working inside Elisra as orders were pouring in and Israel took more and more American-made F-15s and F-16s. Tzvika was also tasked with travelling to the United States to make sure the specially designed electronic warfare system parts that Elisra had manufactured were compatible with the F-15s and F-16s. This was no mean feat. General Dynamics, maker of the F-16, would not give us warranties unless we tested our Elisra systems to make sure they were compatible, Speaker recalls. 
The systems were two feet by two feet, and you need several for each plane. They are in different places of the aircraft. They tested it as a black box to make sure there were not extra electronic current demands that could mess with the big picture, or that you're not sending harmful electromagnetics onto other systems, or that you're not delivering anything that could cause electric shock. They didn't mind if our system didn't alert on the incoming missiles. They only cared that our system didn't mess up the plane in a way that could impact the warranty. Intelligence and aerospace are two core components of Israel's defense doctrine. If one falters, lives will be lost, as there is always an enemy waiting to pounce. Talpiot grads continue to play a major role on both fronts, due in large to their training. The multidisciplinary approaches to complex problems and the ability to master projects that require teamwork and coordination are skills crucial to designing fighter jets and developing intelligent systems. Chapter 5